Hello everyone, welcome to the video object segmentation lecture. In this series of lectures of CV3 DSD, we started by breaking down the image with bounding boxes. So we were interested in finding objects, interesting objects inside the image. And we would actually represent these objects with bounding boxes. We then move towards the temporal domain. What can we do when we have not only one image, but actually a stream of images? We're now interested in bringing object detection and extending it to the temporal domain, thereby trying to solve the task of object tracking. So once we saw this in the first few lectures of this series, we then quickly realized that bounding boxes were not the best representation for objects. And therefore, we moved into object masks. These are more precise representations that indicate for each pixel in the image whether this pixel belongs to a particular instance of an object. So this was the task of object segmentation. We saw the task of semantic segmentation, which means to label every pixel of an image with a semantic category, and instant segmentation, which actually means to also break down those categories into the different instances, the different instances inside a class. For example, the different cars inside the semantic class car. So now we're going to do the same that we did with bounding boxes. We're going to extend this notion through time. So now we want to perform video object segmentation. That is, we take an object, in this case, one of these persons that is dancing, and we want to follow it throughout the video sequence. We want to know exactly which pixels in all the frames belong to that particular object instance. So the goal of video object segmentation is to generate accurate and temporally consistent pixel masks for all objects in a video sequence. You can see some of the examples here. Some objects have, some sequences have one object, some sequences have more than one object and the objects are interacting. We have similar objects, for example, cars, which can be confused with, it, with each other. We have all types of challenges in video object segmentation. One of the biggest challenges is a strong viewpoint or appearance change. So we can see a sequence here in which this dancer is moving around in the scene. And for some frames, we see the front of the dancer. For some frames, we see the back of the dancer. Now the appearance completely changes, the viewpoint for this object completely changes, but we still need to identify that this is the exact same instance. Another big challenge are occlusions. You can see here the bus sequence, which seems simple, but as soon as the bus is occluded by the tree, then things start to become more complicated because we need to actually realize that this bus is now cut into two distinct pieces and there's an occlusion in the middle. And finally, we have scale changes. This is one of the biggest challenges, one that we rarely see in multiple object tracking benchmarks. And that is when the object, for example, in this case, the car, starts in this frame, is far away from the car, from the camera, and then it becomes closer and closer to the camera until it fills pretty much all the frame. So here we have viewpoint changes because we saw the front of the car in one frame and the side of the car in the other frame, but we also have really large scale changes. And if you try to apply any type of consistency measure from one frame to the other, these kind of problems are going to be your biggest challenge. So overall, we have several problems that make it hard for us to make assumptions about the object appearance. These are the challenges of strong viewpoint changes, scale changes, but we also have all types of illumination changes and shape changes. And occlusions actually make it hard for us to make assumptions about the object's motion. And as we have seen in multiple object tracking, we usually deal with these two types of assumptions. Either we work on the object motion, 
constant motion, smooth motion, or we work on learning an object's appearance. And all of these challenges are what make VOS such an interesting problem. So VOS can be generally very broadly categorized into two different tasks. On the left, we have the semi-supervised, also called one-shot, video object segmentation. Now for this task, we have a video sequence and we get the first frame ground truth mask. So we know exactly what object to segment and exactly which pixels represent that object. For the unsupervised task, also called zero shot, we have to find all objects as well as their mask. So we get just the video sequence and we have to discover the objects inside the video sequence and we have to segment them. So we have no idea a priori what kind of objects we will have to segment throughout the sequence. Now for the unsupervised or zero-shot video object segmentation, we have all kinds of methods that essentially perform motion segmentation or salient object detection. You can actually look for these two keywords to see how do researchers approach the task of unsupervised video object segmentation. In this lecture, however, we're going to focus only on semi-supervised video object segmentation. That is, we will have a video sequence and we will get the first frame ground truth mask for all the objects. So we will know exactly what objects we need to segment throughout the video. So here's again the definition of supervised video object segmentation. We're given a first frame ground truth, like for example, this biker here with the green mask around it. And given this segmentation mask, our goal is to obtain pixel accurate segmentation for the entire video. And it doesn't mean that because we get the first frame ground truth, this is actually an easy task. So remember that we have all kind of scale viewpoint changes we also have occlusions, for example, here, the frame in the middle contains no biker because it is occluded by a person. So any type of continuous motion that we want to impose on our biker throughout the sequence will be broken by this frame here. And the supervised video object segmentation is currently a major testing ground for segmentation based tracking. So, of course, we're going to see um, primarily deep learning based methods and deep learning based methods need a lot of data to be trained on. This has led to a number of large scale data sets that just got larger and larger with the years. So we started with the Davis 2016 edition, which had 30 sequences for training, 24 testing. It contained only single objects and we were provided the first frame ground truth. In the 2017 edition, this was expanded to 60 sequences for training and 90 for testing. There were multiple objects with multiple interactions and we were also given the first frame as ground truth. Now we have a larger scale dataset called the YouTube VOS 2018, which contains many more sequences as we can see here, as much as 3,471 for training. It also contains multiple objects and we also have the first frame ground truth when the object actually appears in the first frame. So these um, sequences also contain cases in which in the first frame we have no ground truth object. So before we get started with deep learning methods that actually tackle the task of video object segmentation, we need to remember what do we want to get out of our method. So we want to have, first of all, a pixel-wise output, right? We're not going to talk about bounding boxes, about coordinates, but we're going to talk about a decision for every pixel of our image, whether it belongs to an object or not. And if we're actually talking about pixel-wise outputs, and we're talking about motion, about following an object through a video frame, through a video sequence, there's actually a concept in computer vision that we need to know first. 
we're of course talking about optical flow. So what is optical flow? As input, we get two consecutive images from a video. And as output, we want to get the displacement of every pixel from image A to image B. So essentially, we want to have as output the perceived 2D motion of the scene. Of course, we're not going to get the real motion of the object, but just the projected motion in the camera space. So this is one representation of optical flow. We can see here tiny arrows. The blue, bluish arrows are pointing to the left and the red arrows are pointing to the right. This means that we have this biker that is moving to the left of the image, while the two pedestrians on the right are moving towards the right. The rest of the scene is static, therefore we have no optical flow there to compute. Now it is interesting to see that by just looking at the optical flow, we already have a pretty good instance segmentation result in this particular case. So we have this object on the left, which is a person on the bike, which is moving as a rigid body. Therefore, we can say that all of this area that is moving in a consistent way is, for example, a separate instance. This would be one way of using optical flow for a rough instance segmentation result. Of course, we would have a problem with the two pedestrians on the right because they are moving also consistency and they are somewhat close to each other. So unless we use some sort of instant segmentation or higher level knowledge that these are actually two persons, it's going to be hard to use only motion to separate these two instances. Another representation of optical flow is this colorful representation here on the right. So we can see the two images one on top of the other that showed the motion between one image and the other. So we see, for example, that there is a lot of motion on the right foot of this tennis player and there is a lot of motion on the racket here on the top. And this motion is represented by a more saturated color in the optical flow representation. Now the hue that is represented is actually the direction of the optical flow. So this green color is going to be one direction which is different from the bluish color. And it goes all the way to red colors, purple colors, each of them represents a different direction of the optical flow. So the direction is represented by the hue and the magnitude is represented by the saturation. So, of course, as soon as 2015, we started seeing methods uh, that use CNN to compute optical flow. And this was end-to-end -end supervised learning of optical flow. That means that we get as input the two images that we want to compute uh, the motion between. We feed them to a convolutional neural network, and this produces directly an optical flow map. Now, as we can see, the results are actually quite good. We see that it follows all type of motions. We have this representation with the hue and saturation to represent the, uh, the direction and the magnitude of the optical flow. And this is all with um, convolutional neural networks, so direct prediction of the optical flow output. So how is this actually performed? In Flownet, they present two types of architectures. The first architecture is the one where they take both images and they just stack them. So if every input, every RGB image has three channels, we now stack the two images, which essentially means that we're going to have six channels. And we process this stack of images with a convolutional neural network, same as we would do for a normal RGB input. Now the second architecture they propose is a Siamese architecture and we have already seen in previous lectures how Siamese architectures can be used to compare the content in two images. In this case we want to compare image 1 which is processed by the upper head with image 2 which is processed by the lower head. 
And remember that in the Siamese architecture, both heads have exactly the same weight. So we're processing the two images in exactly the same way. And then in this particular operation here, we're starting to compare those two images in order to find the motion between these two images. So there are two key design choices that make FlowNet architecture to work really well. And the first interesting one is actually how to combine the information from both images. And this is done by using what they call the correlation layer. Now, the interesting thing about this correlation layer is that it contains no learnable weights. So the only operation that we're doing here is we're multiplying a feature vector by another feature vector and obtaining a matching score between both feature vectors. So let's see how this works in practice. We have here the feature map F1 coming from the first image. This feature map has a spatial resolution of H by W and has number of channels C. Now in parallel, we have the second feature map, which is F2, which has the exact same size because we have processed both images with the same weight. So the first operation that we do is we flatten those feature maps and we flatten them by the spatial uh, resolution. So essentially we will obtain a map which is C by W times H. So we just basically put all the spatial content into one direction. So this essentially means that one feature Fi of length C is now going to represent one particular spatial location. Of course, this spatial location does not correspond to one pixel in the image, but corresponds to a patch in the image because we actually have done some downscaling with, uh, with the convolutional neural network. Nonetheless, Fi represents one feature, one location in the original image F1. And what we want to do now is we want to compare all the features, all the locations of the first image with all the locations of the second image. And for this, we essentially multiply all the feature vector Fi by all the feature vectors Fj. We multiply them um, coordinate, so every coordinate, every element of Fi is going to be multiplied by the corresponding element in Fj, and then we're going to sum up all the results of this multiplication. And this is going to give us a score Sij, which represents the matching score between one location in F1 and one location in F2. And this brings us to this matrix, <clears throat> which is the matching score, which is W times H by W times H. And this essentially tells us how similar one location in the first image is to another location in the second image, according to the features extracted by our neural network. Now, this is really cool because this is a fixed operation. We have no learnable weights whatsoever here. So this is a very cheap layer to input there. We are adding absolutely no parameters, but we're computing a very interesting operation of comparison. So again, the matching score represents how correlated two feature vectors are, and therefore how correlated two regions in image one and image two are. Now, the correlation layer can be used in a number of applications. So for anyone interested in 3D reconstruction, one can also use the correlation layer for finding image correspondences. For example, for finding correspondences between image A and image B, these would be semantic correspondences between the two motorbikes. And these correspondences can then be used to find the transformation from image A to image B. So anyone interested in that can check the CUPR 2017 paper, Convolutional Neural Network Architecture for Geometric Matching. Now we saw the first key design choice, the correlation layer, which can be used in a number of architectures for many applications. Now, the second key design choice is actually how to upsample our feature map 
to obtain high quality results. So in the end, we're going to want an output which has a nice spatial resolution. And therefore, we're going to have to upsample our results, our feature map. Now, we already saw quite a lot of uh, content on autoencoders, on UNET, and this use basically the same ideas as we saw in there. Skip connections, up convolutions, so we're not going to take a further look into the second key design choice. So now the question is, can we actually use optical flow to do video object segmentation? Now for sure, we can do video object segmentation by focusing on the flow of the object and segmenting the object based on the flow. Now, of course, one can improve segmentation by improving optical flow, and one can improve optical flow by improving segmentation. So if we have this initial optical flow prediction here, once we know the instances, once we know the objects that are moving around in the scene, we can improve our predicted optical flow to obtain, as you can see, better boundaries around the objects. And what this paper proposed to do was to iteratively improve segmentation and optical flow. And this was a state of the art in 2016. So what happened after that was pretty much a paradigm change. And this came with the method OSBOS. OSBOS stands for One Shot Video Object Segmentation. And the goal of this approach was to learn the appearance of the object to track by performing fine tuning on the first frame ground truth mask. So the main contribution of the work was to propose separate training steps, a pre-training for objectness so that the network can learn what it means to have an object in the scene, and then a subsequent first frame adaptation to the specific object of interest. So essentially fine tuning the network to the specific appearance of the object to track. The proposed one-shot video object segmentation method starts with a pre-trained network. This is usually the case for computer vision algorithms to have a base network pre-trained on ImageNet, that is, for the task of image classification. Now, as you can see in this result here, if we would test our network for segmentation, we would essentially get activations which represent edges and basic image features. And that is what you get from pre-training on ImageNet. Now, in a subsequent step, we need to train OSBOS, we need to train the network for the actual task of video object segmentation. For this, we do what is called the parent network training. That is training the network to perform general video object segmentation. So we show the network all the sequences on the Davis training set, and therefore the network sees persons, buses, bears, and it learns what it means to do video object segmentation, what it means to separate the foreground object from the background. Now, once this is done, of course, the neural network has no notion of which object is going to be the foreground. Therefore, if you actually apply it, to the, the test image in order to obtain foreground background segmentation, you will obtain that all the crowd in the front here in this particular image is going to be segmented as a foreground object. So now the third step in training OSVOS is actually the fine tuning step. The step where we tell the network what is the object of interest. And interestingly, learning the appearance of that particular object can be done by fine-tuning the parent network on the first frame of the test sequence. So this is going to be our test sequence, it's going to be the video of this dancer, and we just have the first frame ground truth. We show the network this first frame ground truth with a little bit of data augmentation, of course, so the network doesn't overfit to this particular image. And now the network has learned which object to segment. So instead of segmenting 
the full crowd as it did here, it's going to segment only the object of interest. Now, the interesting thing here is that there is no separate way of learning the appearance, but it's just about how you train the neural network and which steps you take for training this neural network, in this case, a separate pre-training, training for the task of general video object segmentation, and as a third step, fine-tuning, that is training for only a few iterations, for this particular object and this particular sequence. Of course, the drawback is that you need to perform fine-tuning at test time. Therefore, it takes a little bit of time to actually fine-tune on this first frame of the test sequence. Now, it is called one shot because we see the first frame ground truth. This we have already discussed. And the key of OSPOS is actually the fine tuning step. Now, technically, what we're doing in this step is we're overfitting to the first frame of the test sequence. Right? So we have only one image to train on. We have a little bit of data augmentation, some rotations, uh, some simple transformations, but essentially you're learning with really very few data. But this overfitting is used to the advantage of OSBOS because it is used to learn the appearance or the foreground object. Now at the same time we're learning the appearance of the background object. It's not that we're looking only at the foreground object and trying to build an appearance model, which is something that other methods do or methods, for example, in multiple object tracking do. But here we have access to the full image and we know for all the pixels in the image, which ones are labeled foreground and which ones are labeled background. Therefore, OSBOS in this third step, the fine tuning step, it's overfitting and it's learning the appearance of the foreground and the background. Now, at test time, each frame is processed independently, so there's absolutely no temporal information, no optical flow, no concatenation of frames, nothing. This um, is really a frame-by-frame -frame approach. So, as a frame-based segmentation, without any kind of um, temporal consistency, it has several advantages. The first one is that it recovers well from occlusions. If you have a mask propagation method or if you have an optical flow method, you will see that once there is an occlusion, for example, the biker that goes behind those trees here and there is further motion blur as there is in this sequence, then the mask gets sort of stuck in the occlusion in the case of optical flow based methods. And therefore, it is very hard to recover the object once the occlusion um, has, been, has been resolved. In frame-based segmentation, of course, as we're processing uh, the video frame by frame and the frames are processed independently, occlusions are usually not a problem. Of course, the great disadvantage is that the method can be temporally inconsistent and therefore we can have good predictions like this one where they focus mostly on the biker, on the object of interest, but we can also have back predictions in which we have this really large false positive somewhere else in the image where it makes absolutely no sense. But experiments, especially on highly dynamic scenes, show that this method is actually very robust. So even if there are strong occlusions, strongly uh, moving objects, like for example, this, uh, this kite surfer here with all the splashing water, or the sequence of the car that is turning around, therefore changing the appearance drastically, changing the pose, changing the size, plus the smoke that, is, that also makes, um, makes it difficult for appearance models. Um, even though these two scenes are really challenging, such a simple, a method as the one that Oswald presents is actually working really, really well. Now we're going to show a little bit of experiments of the accuracy that one gets if we have access to more annotations. So for now we have looked at the case where we have just the first frame annotation. 
So for example, we uh, want to tackle the task of object removal from a video. So we want to remove completely an object from a video. Now what we would do is we would first segment that object and then try to find the segmentation mask in all subsequent frames so that we can remove those pixels and impaint the image with other pixels that mimic, for example, the background. Now, of course, if you're interested in doing this professionally, you will probably do this manually, but Osvos can help out by allowing users to just provide a few masks. So, for example, the first frame mask. If you provide only the first frame mask, and we're looking now at this sequence, uh, you will see that everything goes smoothly, the background is separated from the foreground, until a second camel appears in the scene. Now what happens is that this camel, the appearance of this camel, is exactly the same as the appearance of the first camel. And therefore it's virtually impossible for Oswald to actually disambiguate these two camels and separate them into two instances. So, of course, one solution would be to use, for example, object proposals, which we have seen in past lectures, but keeping the solution within the Oswald's framework, what one can do is add a second annotation. So, the user provides an annotation on another frame where the second camel can be seen. And in that frame, the second camel is annotated as background. So now the network has the chance not only to learn the appearance of the first camel and the background, but to learn that there is a second camel and this is also part of the background. So as you add this annotation, you can see that for the same frame that we're looking at before, now the segmentation is much more accurate. So most of the pixels that were in the second camel and they were labeled as foreground are, have now basically disappeared. And if we add a third annotation, then we can see that the problem is almost completely solved. So by adding annotation, we can actually improve the accuracy of the results. Now, as I have briefly mentioned before, one of the drawbacks of the method is that you actually need to perform the fine tuning also at test time. So in this plot, we're observing what is the time that we need to process each frame in the x-axis versus the accuracy in the y-axis. And the accuracy is measured by the region similarity, but we will talk about metrics towards the end of the lecture. So we start with this point here, in which um, we represent one forward pass of the parent network. So there is no fine tuning, and this would of course lead to quite poor results, but it would be really fast because one forward pass of the parent network takes 102 milliseconds. Of course, this depends on the backbone, on the architecture that you choose, but this was for the architecture that Oswald chose. Now, the curve here, the red curve, represents how the accuracy increases as you perform more fine tuning steps. Therefore, as it takes longer to process each frame, but at the same time, you're increasing the accuracy. And know that the time per frame includes the fine-tuning time at the beginning divided by the length of the whole sequence. Now you see that for uh, processing of one second per frame, we can get much, much better results than the state of the art until the time. And that point where um, the object flow results are, these are the results that we are discussing at the beginning of the lecture, where we use the optical flow of the objects and we iterate between improving segmentation and improving optical flow prediction. So you see there are almost 12 percentage points um, better with a fraction of the time that it takes to process each frame. So the method in comparison is actually really fast. Now the difference between the red curve and the black curve is just a post-processing step which is called boundary snapping, but we will not go into details here. So the basic method is represented by the red curve. 
Now, Oswald does not have any notion of object, right? It does not have any notion of object chain. It just processes pixels in a separate way. So in this sense, it's a pure appearance-based method. So if the foreground or the background, because remember that we're not only learning the appearance of the foreground, but we're also implicitly learning the appearance of the background. So if the appearance of either foreground or background change too much, then the method is going to fail. So let's look at this example. This is one of the, of the failure cases that I like the most. So this is the first frame of our video sequence. We have this break dancer, we have this crowd of people. And in the first frame, we get to learn what is the appearance of the background crowd and what is the appearance of the foreground object. And you might not see it well here, but this foreground object has a red sweater. And so we're learning that red sweater is basically foreground. So what happens in subsequent frames? The break dancer moves. So aside uh, of having a few errors in the legs of the break dancer, we also have this person that was occluded in the first frame, right? This is the first frame, so that person was occluded. So the network never saw that person and never associated it with background. So once it reappears, the network thinks that this person is foreground and therefore segments it because it has a red sweater. So this is one of the failure cases that it can only be solved with more annotations, but it cannot be solved if we want to do only first frame annotation and subsequent uh, video automatic video object segmentation. Nonetheless, um, this only happens because we don't have any object prior, right? If we have an object prior, it is clear that the break dancer is one object and this person is a completely separate object, right? So aside from having similar appearance, it is quite easy for any detector, for any instant segmentation method to actually say that these two are different instances of the same class. And we have already seen models that have this idea of an object shape, that have this idea of an object instance. So why not using instance segmentation methods that give us this separation between different objects and we combine it with the power of Oswald's? So this leads to the first extension of Oswald's, which is called Oswald's S for semantic Oswald's. And essentially the idea there is to perform what they call semantic propagation. So here we have this input image, and in the lower branch, we have the classic Osvos branch. So the branch that actually learns the appearance from the first frame ground truth mask. And this first frame ground truth mask um, fine tuning leads to a segmentation which looks like this. So the foreground estimation is okay, but it's not really complete. It doesn't really um, show the whole object or segments it as a whole object because it has no idea of an object. So what the authors propose to do here is to add a top branch, which they call the semantic prior. So we have really good semantic instance segmentation methods that give us instance proposals. So they tell us that this is a motorbike, this is a person, this is a car, this is another person, and so separates the scene into different objects and different instances. So now what we can do is we can take these instance proposals and we can use the output of Osvos to select the proposals that mostly overlap with the Osvos prediction. With this, we get what they call the top matching instances, so essentially, what kind of proposals have overlap with the Osvos model? And therefore, what kind of proposals are going to be interesting to follow in the next frames? And with the top matching instances and the output of the Osvos appearance model, another classifier outputs the final segmentation results. Now, the nice thing is that semantics stay coherent throughout the sequence. So if in the first frame we have selected a motorbike and a person as our proposals, as our 
um, prior segmentation knowledge that we want to keep throughout the sequence, we know that 100 frames ahead, we're still going to be looking for a person proposal and a motorbike proposal. So this is a really strong prior that the semantic branch gives us. And so what this essentially causes is um, a completeness in the results. So we're looking here at um, the instant segmentation proposals that we get at the beginning. We get the first frame ground truth. So of course, the first selection of proposals is virtually perfect because we have the ground truth in the first frame. So this allows us to select two proposals, the person proposal and the motorbike proposal. Now, what is going to happen is in the first um, frames, the ones closest to um, the first frame ground truth, OSWAS is going to give still pretty good results. Of course, the um, overlap with the motorbike proposal and the person proposal is still very high, so the output is still quite good. Now, as we move forward with OSWAS only, which is the row here in the middle, you can see that results are breaking down. Right? We have seen the motorbike from the front. So as the motorbike shifts and we're seeing the side of the motorbike, this is an appearance that Oswos cannot cope with and therefore it considers it as background. So the Oswos output for this sequence would be this red mask here in the middle, which is virtually incomplete. Nonetheless, this is still a good enough prior to select the correct proposals from uh, the instant segmentation proposals. And therefore, we can have a much more complete segmentation output if we combine these proposals with the OSWAS result. This approach would work well as long as we have some mask that is overlapping the actual ground truth proposals. So the proposals that really represent that object. So if we don't have any mask from OSVOS that would be overlapping neither the motorbike nor the person, then there would be no way to make this selection for these two proposals. And therefore, it is very possible that the whole segmentation would be lost. So this happens if the object really changes its appearance a lot from one frame to the other. This can be caused by post changes of the object, fast moving object, camera changes, or uh, when the model cannot really adapt to the new appearance. So for example, in this case, we have the dancer. In the first frame, we see the front of the dancer, but the dancer is moving fast, so at some frame, we're actually seeing only the back. And the problem here is that the model can only cope with the appearance in the legs, but the appearance in the upper body is too different from the one that it has learned. This is also due to the fact that the camera is also shifting and therefore it has to take into account different background. So of course, this, this kind of drifting problem is a well-known problem for any kind of method that deals with videos. Now, the thing is that this dancer did not go from this initial position to a back position in one frame, but the change was, that was actually gradual. So now the question would be, if the change is gradual, why not gradually update the model so that it adapts slowly to the appearance changes, which are small frame by frame, so that when we reach this third frame here, we're not surprised by this new appearance, but we had time to adapt to the new appearance. So this is what um, the second um, extension of OSWAS proposes to do, online adaptation. Essentially, adapt the model to appearance changes that happen every frame, and not just fine-tune to the first frame. So here we're going to iteratively fine-tune the model on the previous prediction of every frame. So you can imagine that this is going to be extremely slow. Nonetheless, we're going to be able to adapt the model to appearance changes. And so how essentially this works is we're going to have the baseline, which they call an adaptive base, unadapted baseline, which is essentially the OSVOS output. 
And then we're going to have the collection of new ground truth. So in blue, we have the pixels that we're going to consider as the new background samples. And in red, the pixels that we're going to consider as the foreground samples. So these are the pixels, the red pixels, the foreground samples, are taken from the predictions of Oswos, where Oswos is really, really confident about the output. So the most confident pixels are taken as new foreground samples. And the pixels that are further away from these red pixels are taken as the new background samples. And with the first frame, and with these red and blue pixels, we can fine-tune our model. And we can get an online adapted model, which now has much more coherent results, as you can see here on the third row. So you can see that the results are much, much better. For example, in this frame here, we get almost all the objects segmented. Also here, the back of the cart was completely missing from Osbos, and now it can be recovered. And also, the problem with the, with the motorbike is that also other objects were selected as foreground. But now, since we are selecting these blue background samples, which are far away from the object, to be background, we can now also separate those instances, separate those cars, and learn that they are background and not foreground. Now, another way of dealing with drifting is by posing the problem as a mass refinement problem. So the assumption that you make is that your object, therefore your mask, is going to move only slightly from frame to frame, right? So there is a natural coherent evolution from frame by frame where the mask move just slightly. So we can start with an approximate mask, for example, from the previous frame, from a coarse estimate, or from the ground truth, in the case of semi-supervised video object segmentation. And then we can use a refinement network. So just a network that takes the mask estimate and refines it for the current frame. So we can actually take advantage of what is called the crop and zoom. So we can actually just look at a patch and perform the refinement on that patch. We don't really need to see the whole image to perform the refinement of the segmentation mask. So like this, we can get actually higher resolution outputs. And this is essentially what they propose in mask track. They propose to use a confnet that takes the input frame at, at uh, time t and takes the mask estimate at time t minus 1. And you can see the tiny shift that the camel has gone through from uh, frame t minus 1 to frame t. And this is the shift that mask, ta mask track needs to focus on. So mask track then gives us output the refined mask at frame t. So another question that one might ask is, why is the paper called learning video object segmentation from static images, right? We have access to a collection of videos with ground truth masks. So why is this paper claiming that one can train video object segmentation models with just static images? Well, the idea is to use a technique similar to what is used to train the regressor of faster CNN. So remember that to train the regressor of faster CNN, one could take ground truth bounding box and simulate small displacements. So you would slightly shift the box, change the width and the height of the box just slightly, and simulate all these displacements, and then train a faster CNN regressor to shift the bounding box towards the ground truth position. This was also a concept used in Tractor to train models for tracking by using static images. So here they do the same, but with masks. So essentially, they simulate the training inputs. They simulate the deformations that the mask can go through and then train the neural network to go back to the ground truth mask. So here we have the annotated image depicted in A, and we have two deformations of the mask. You can see here that this curve of the bear has been slightly deformed, the leg has also been deformed, and here there's even a larger deformation. 
And these are the training masks that simulate what the bear can look like at frame t minus 1. So then the network gets the, uh, the image at frame t, gets this mask, which is a simulated mask of frame t minus 1, and the goal of the network is to regress the original annotated ground truth mask. So you only need one mask, one image with ground truth, to actually train mask track. So these are three other papers um, ranging from 2017 to 2019, papers that include optical flow propagation um, to, to be combined with uh, the methods that we have presented for video object segmentation. The second one is a clever data augmentation method that could be applied actually to any um, video object segmentation algorithm. And the third one is a method that proposes to use re-identification techniques like the ones we have seen for multiple object tracking to actually recover from long occlusions. So these are three papers that I would recommend you to read if you want to expand, if you want to know more about video object segmentation. So let's move now to an entirely different set of approaches, the approaches that are proposal-based. So up until now, we have seen methods that take the whole image as an input. And some of them use proposals on top just to refine the mass generation. This is the case of OSVOS S that use the proposals in the semantic branch to provide this idea of an object, this idea of an object shape. What we will see now are methods that start with proposals. So the inputs of the method are directly proposal, and the goal is to link them through the frames of the video. And this is similar to what we did in tracking by detection, where we started by bounding box detections, and then we linked them through time to recover trajectories. This is very much the same, but starting with instant segmentation proposals, and then going towards the temporal domain to link them and recover full trajectories. So we're going to use instant segmentation networks, for example, Masker CNN, to obtain our instant segmentation proposals. And then one approaches video object segmentation by taking these proposals at each frame and performing some sort of merging algorithm, some sort of data association um, algorithm on top in order to link them in time, to link them from frame to frame. From all the proposal-based methods, I would like to focus our attention on PrimeVos because this is an approach that combines all of the previous video object segmentation principle and gives state-of-the-art results. So the method is actually pretty complex because it combines first frame fine-tuning mask refinement, optical flow mass propagation, clever data augmentation, object appearance re-identification, and is based on proposals as the initial units to work on. So it really combines all the principles to create a rather complex method, but of course, that delivers really good results. So let's look at how it works. We start with uh, proposal generation. So we've already mentioned that these are proposal-based methods. So the basic unit of computation that we will have are the category agnostic mask and proposals. And it is important to note here that we have the category agnostic proposals. Now this is the first step and also gives uh, the P to the name Premvos for proposals. The second step is a refinement step. So we're going to use a fully convolutional segmentation network that is trained to refine the segmentation given a proposal bounding box. So we're given a box where the object of interest might be. And from this box, we're actually going to refine it and obtain a segmentation out of it. The third uh, letter, M, comes from merging. Actually, it's the fourth letter, but uh, the second name refinement gives two letters, R, E, so that we can actually pronounce this name. But the third concept is the concept of merging. 
Merging is actually a greedy decision process. So, so it's kind of a heuristic base um, and it's going to choose the proposals with the best score. And these proposals with the best score, of course, you have to start making decisions which are going to be harder as you have occlusions, which are going to be harder as you have several proposals that overlap with each other and that all represent objects which could be of interest. Now, there's an optional proposal expansion or uh, extension through time with optical flow. And it turns out that the proposal score is a complex combination of the objectness score, the mass propagation, intersection over union score with optical flow propagation, the re-ID score, and what they call the object-object interaction scores. So, so it's a rather complex mechanism to decide what is the final proposal that we would output as a segmentation mask. So it's very complex and we don't want to go into all the tiny engineering details to make it actually a winner. Because it is a winner, it won the Davis Challenge 2018, it won the YouTube VOS Challenge also in 2018, and results are pretty impressive. So it can deal with many objects, uh, with occlusions, you can see here, for example, the dancer sequence that the persons are occluding each other, and there are relatively few errors present in this method. So very impressive results, even though the method is quite complex. So from this paper, the nice thing is that we can learn a lot of things, right? So um, the authors tried a lot of methods, so there were a lot of lessons learned from this paper. Now, the first challenge was how to generate proposals. Now, deep learning-based region proposal generators are perfect for the task. So one can directly use Mascar CNN or Sharp Mask and they actually found out that these are good enough to perform the task of proposal generation for datasets like Davis or like YouTube VOS. So this is an important lesson learned. The second challenge was actually how to track these region proposals, how to expand the IDs in time, how to merge these proposals in time. Now, very simple region overlap worked as a consistency measure, and this is really important because this is really the simplest thing you can do to perform tracking, is to compute, for example, IOU. But of course, optical flow really helps, especially if the object moves a lot and the region overlap is, uh, is not so helpful anymore. You can use optical flow to kind of look ahead and know where you can expect the object to have moved. And of course, with pixel-wise optical flow, you get a lot of information if you're dealing with masks. And of course, for long-term occlusions, re-ID is very, very helpful. Now, open issues that Prem was had was that, of course, it worked in 2D, so it had no notion of the real motion of objects, the real 3D motion that objects had in 3D space. So it is very hard to reason about occlusions if you have no idea of the 3D space. And also, exactly the same as for multiple uh, object tracking, the initialization and termination logic is really, really hard. It's very heuristic-based, but it's absolutely needed for real tracking. So imagine that I start my trajectory, and suddenly I can no longer identify where this object is because there are occlusions or because the scene has changed a lot and I can no longer rely on my appearance model and there is no proposal on top of the object. Now you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision to either terminate the track or wait a little bit, maybe look ahead and make some prediction of where the track could be and wait to re-identify the track in future frames. What can happen is that if you terminate too early, then once the object reappears after the occlusion, you have lost it and you have to initialize another track. So you have, first of all, an identity switch and second of all, you might even lose the initialization of the new track because you have to have good track initialization logics. So here termination and initialization are linked together. So there is the first case when you decide to be conservative 
and kill the track early on. The second approach is to wait for a little while. So to make some predictions, to um, predict, for example, where the bounding box, where the segmentation mask will go into the, free, into the future, even if you don't have any feedback from the image that tells you that this is the correct path that the object is following, but you make some sort of future prediction and you wait for the object to reappear so that you can re-identify it. The problem is that if you wait too long, your prediction can drift to a region where the object didn't go. So you start creating what is called ghost trajectories, trajectories that don't exist. Or it can be that the object reappears, but you don't re-ID it because you depend then on the re-ID score, which is of course also not perfect. So, so there is really a balance between initialization, termination, re-ID, and long-term occlusions are really a problem. And of course, if you're not dealing with semi-supervised video object segmentation, how to obtain the initial segmentation is also a question to be answered. Good, so after looking at proposal-based approaches, we would look at a completely different type of approaches. Approaches then rely on what is called retrieval. So what is exactly that? In this case, we're performing a very special type of retrieval, and that is pixel-wise retrieval. So we already know that re-identification networks based on bounding box region proposals work really well, and we have seen this for multiple object tracking, how re-ID was used there. So here what we're going to do is we're going to extend this high-level idea and we're going to do re-identification for every pixel. So we're going to have embeddings for the pixels at training time and embeddings for the pixels at test time and by re-identifying these pixels, so knowing whether they are closer to the foreground pixels or the background pixels, we're going to be able to label them as foreground or background at test time. Let's see how the method works in more detail. So here we have a sketch of the method. And at first we can see at the top the user input. Now this input can be in any form. It can be the first frame ground truth mask in the case of semi-supervised segmentation, or it can be a series of scribbles in the case of interactive segmentation. So we don't need to really label every pixel and provide it as a user input. The user input can have any shape. And this is because we're going to take only the pixels that are labeled and we're going to put them into our embedding space. Now what happens during training? We have a reference image and we have the user input, any type of ground truth annotation. Now we have our embedding network, which is essentially a convolutional neural network, fully convolutional neural network, which is going to map our pixels to an embedding space. And now we're going to train our neural network with a triplet loss, same as we did for re-ID. And we're going to want to bring the foreground pixels together. And we're going to want to separate them as far away as possible from the background pixels. So essentially trying to separate these two clusters of foreground pixels and background pixels. And we do have the user input, therefore we have a form of ground truth that we can use for, uh, to co actually compute the loss function. So this is how we train a neural network. Essentially this mapping from pixels to an embedding space is what's important here. At test time, what happens? we need to embed the pixels of both our annotated frame and our test frame. And we do this with our embedding network. So we have a reference image in the case of semi-supervised video object segmentation. This would be the first frame and we would have the ground truth mask provided by the, by the task itself. And then we would have the test image. Now we would map both the pixels of the reference image as well as the pixels of the test image to the embedding space. The pixels of the reference image are labeled by nature because we have the ground truth. And now we need to label the pixels of the test image, right? This is our goal at test time. And this is very, very easy 
because we can do the same that we did for retrieval, we can perform a nearest neighbor search for the test pixels. So we can, for example, say, what is the nearest pixel to this one here in the embedding space? If this is a foreground pixel, we directly label this pixel with a foreground label. And the same if it's a background label. So by just doing a forward pass plus a really fast nearest neighbor search, we can actually label our test image. We don't really require to retrain our model for each sequence to fine tune our model for each sequence as in OSVOS. This is why the method is called blazingly fast video object segmentation with pixel wise metric learning. So we have talked about many methods, but we have forgotten that we're actually dealing with videos. So some methods like OSVOS or like this uh, pixel-wise retrieval method, they don't even take into account the temporal information. But there is actually some temporal information that we can probably exploit, right? We're dealing with video, we're dealing with a sequence of image, images and objects that move. And we have not really talked about one of the tools that can be used for dealing with sequences, which is actually recurrent neural networks. So, of course, recurrent neural networks have also been used for the task of VOS, and this leads us to the third and last type of approaches that um, aim to solve uh, video object segmentation. And these are the ones that also take very explicitly the temporal information into account. Therefore, um, we decided to call them spatiotemporal approaches. And we will start with an approach that uses recurrent neural networks. This approach also does one-shot video object segmentation, which means that we have access to the first frame ground truth, which is placed here at time step t equals to zero. And this is fed to what they call the initializer. So the initial state for a recurrent neural network is obtained from the first frame ground truth mask. Now, um, this initialization is then processed by a convolutional LSTM, right? The recurrent part is taken care of by an LSTM, but we still need to distill information from the image. And this is done through a CNN encoder, which gives us a feature map, which is processed within the LSTM. And then a decoder is used to actually predict the mask at each time step. Now the convel STM is the one that tracks the object that takes care of the temporal evolution of, um, of the object mask and the decoder is the one that takes the information from the encoder, so from the current frame, then um, interprets also the information uh, of the convel STM, which is the temporal information, and finally decodes uh, the, the feature map into this foreground background uh, image. Now the key thing here is that if we have multiple objects, each of them is going to be predicted independently. Same as for OSWAS, by the way, if we have multiple objects, we need to fine tune a network for each of these objects. And this is the same here. If we actually want to deal with multiple objects plus the temporal information that is being processed by the previous method, we essentially get to a method called RVOS, which has both spatial and temporal LSTMs. Now, the spatial LSTMs are used to output one instance mask at a time. So this was an idea already presented in this paper, ECCV 2016, Recurrent Instance Segmentation, in which a convolutional LSTM processed one frame, then output one instance, and the second instance was outputted as if the instances were some sort of sequence. Right? So you don't know how many instances you're going to have in a video. Therefore, you can actually use LSTMs and interpret the instances as essentially a list of um, objects that you need to output in a recurrent fashion. 
Of course, this is not an optimal solution because there is no natural order between instances, right? Why should the dog be outputted first than the person or than the table or than the chair? So this is the decision that you have to make, but you can in fact use LSTMs to output instances one at a time. So this was presented in 2016 and now this CEPR 2019 paper that we see here on the right combines the two ideas of using a convex LSTM both to output the instances one at a time and at the same time to put together the temporal information that we have in video object segmentation as we saw in the previous paper. Hence you have this double spatial and temporal LSTM. Now the nice thing about this method is that the instance generation, so the LSTM that goes through the instances in one image, and the temporal coherence, so the LSTM that goes through the frames, are both trained in an end-to-end -end fashion. So you can train the whole system together in an end-to-end -end fashion. Also a nice thing is that the image just needs to be processed once, unlike the conf LSTM example before, because before what we had this was that for each instance, for each object, we needed to process the image and train uh, and use this conf LSTM to actually output this instance through the frames. Well, here we can deal with all of the instances and all of the frames at the same time. Therefore, each image is just processed once. So it's more efficient. And you can see here how this works with the different instances being outputted at different time frames. You first output the person, then the horse, then uh, I think this is a dog. And uh, there's also the temporal recurrence that is taking place for each of the instances. And of course, one instance is, um, knows about the other instances, so you are more likely not to have conflicting the results because you know what kind of instances were, um, were outputted before thanks to the recurrence. As we already saw some lectures ago, recurrent neural networks have been largely replaced for natural language processing. And they have been replaced by the transformer architecture, which we glanced at in one of the previous lectures. So why not doing the same here? And in fact, one could replace recurrent architectures by transformers or a version of transformers, like the authors did in this ICCV19 paper. So very recent method here and current state of the art on the Davis dataset by, I would say, quite a large margin. So the idea here is that we have attention on um, spatial locations, different spatial locations, but we use the same idea of transformers of um, putting together these key that is coming from the space-time memory and this value that will come from the query encoder to actually find out what kind of information am I going to use to decode the current frame. So I would recommend that you read uh, this paper, very interesting paper, also state-of-the-art and a nice application of transformers also in the spatial domain. And of course, if we can use transformers, we can use the very related graph attention networks. We also briefly talked about the connection between these two techniques. And in this paper, they actually use it for zero-shot segmentation, but one could also use it for one-shot video object segmentation. So I would also recommend you to read this paper if you're interested in zero-shot segmentation. So overall, we have seen many methods for video object segmentation. Many of the methods build an appearance model, so base their strength on building a strong appearance model like OSVOS or OSVOS as of course and ONOVOS with the online adaptation and also partially PREMVOS. Then we have the shape that is introduced by the semantic guidance head through mask proposals through mask RCNN proposals in the case of OSVOS-S. 
And finally, we have several methods that use either motion information in the form of mask refinement or in the form of recurrent architectures and methods that use matching as the prime method to link, uh, for example, proposals into two frames or to link content into frames like read voz or also uh, one of the elements that is inside Prambles. So here you just have a, a colorful separation of the different methods and what are the strengths of each, what, what does each actually propose to do to tackle the task of video object segmentation. So let's move now to the end of the lecture in which we will be talking about the evaluation and metrics. So how do we actually evaluate the performance of video object segmentation methods? We start by first measuring the accuracy of our prediction. So essentially the region similarity between the ground truth mask and the predicting mask. And this is done with the intersection of reunion again with the Jacquard index. So we already know how this region similarity works. A second measure, which is specific for masks, is the contour accuracy. And this actually measures the precision and recall of the boundary pixels. And both precision and recall are put together in what is called the F measure. So the precision can be measured as the division between the true positives in the denominator and in the denominator, the sum between true positives and false positives. So essentially, out of all the boxes that you predicted, how many of those were true positives? And the recall is the ratio between the true positives and the sum of true positives and false negatives. That is, out of all the boxes that are there, that, that are true in the ground truth, how many were you able to recover? So these two concepts of precision and recall we saw already for bounding boxes and here these are the same but for pixels. So we're evaluating whether a pixel is a true positive for a boundary pixel or not. So how many of the boundary pixels did you detect properly and how precise did you detect them? So we use the same concepts of precision and recall that we had for bounding boxes, but now we use them for boundary pixels. And we put precision and recall together into the F measure with this expression. Now we have a third metric for video object segmentation, and this is the one of temporal stability. This sort of measures the evolution of object shapes. Therefore, how stable are the boundaries in time? So if your method delivers a lot of false positives, a lot of small regions here and there all throughout the image, the stability of your mask is not going to be very high. Your, your boundaries are going to change all the time. Or if your mask, for example, degrades in time and is made smaller and smaller or larger and larger, then also your temporal stability is going to be very low. Now, how you actually measure this temporal stability is by estimating the deformation of the mask from frame T to frame T plus 1. Now, if this transformation is smooth and is precise, then the result is stable. And bad results are given, for example, by jittery mask evolution, so masks that change all the time and they are not consistent in time. But during occlusions, of course, this measure is not reliable anymore because the mask is suddenly stopped. Therefore, this measure has been largely dropped due to its instability during occlusions. So what one currently uses to measure temporal stability is um, error measure statistics. So from the region similarity, you can measure, for example, the mean region similarity, which gives you an idea of the average similarity, average Jacquard index for the whole data set. So if your mask evolves in a non-stable way or disappears in, in one frame, you're going to uh, have that reflected in the mean region similarity. But the most indicative measure for uh, judging temporal stability and the one that is used nowadays in modern benchmarks is the DK, which quantifies the performance loss or gain over time. 
always with respect to region similarity. And finally, you can also measure, for example, the recall, which is going to be the fraction of sequences that score higher than a threshold, also in terms of region similarity. So for how many sequences can you detect the mask with at least 50% IOU, for example? Now that we have seen in depth the methods used for multiple object tracking and the methods used for video object segmentation, we want to merge both problems. We want to create a problem that merges the challenges of multiple object tracking and segmentation. And this leads us to the transition from video object segmentation to multiple object tracking and segmentation, or MODS for short. So video object segmentation is generally limited by the first frame mask being given in the supervised case, short video clips with objects that are present in almost all frames, so few occlusions, objects in a video which are mostly from different categories, so, so there is no idea of um, classes of objects that you have to follow through the video or classes of objects that interact with each other and therefore make it hard to differentiate between them. And in general, there are few objects to track. So something around seven objects per video is the maximum that we see in modern benchmarks. So although very important and very hard as a task, there are limitations to video object segmentation. So this is why we are promoting multiple object tracking and segmentation as a task, or MODS for short. So in this scenario, we would have a large number of objects. We're talking about 20, 40 objects, mostly of the same category, for example, persons or cars, so that you have a lot of ambiguity because all of the instances look very, very similar. Also, very long sequences in which you have to track through occlusion, so you have to deal with appearing objects, disappearing objects, and also all of this done in an unsupervised way, so that you have no first frame annotation provided. Of course, you have the previous knowledge that you have very specific categories, for example, pedestrians present in the scene, and you can now take advantage of that. So for this, um, we have proposed a new uh, data set coming to MOD Challenge, that is the MODS data set for pedestrian tracking and segmentation, in which we not only have to track the objects with a bounding box, but we also have to segment them into different instances. Thank you very much for following the lecture on video object segmentation, and see you next week for the next lecture.